bill is introduced in the Senate. The Senate is not the co-sponsorship haven that the House is. Lots and lots of people co-sponsor bills in the House. In the Senate, if you get like 10 or 12 co-sponsors, that's like huge. Um, people just don't sponsor. It's not, it's not the same as in the House. So um, S-509 is the credit union bill. And if your senator is a sponsor or a co-sponsor of this bill, it will be noted there. So, um, and so this issue is, uh, is, is uh, important to us, and you can use these voting records to get an idea of where they are. We did also use some old, um, some old um, bills. There should be some on, um, uh, last year we used some on, on carried interest. Sometimes we use ones from like previous, you know, two years previous. We just use the best information we can get. So this should at least help you to, um, to get an idea of where we are in the voting record. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the bill on the Senate is 2919. It's a credit income, I think I said it differently. So um, that's what you have for the record. You can use that just to get an idea of where they're standing on your issues um, when you're talking to them. Okay, on to the, I'm going to talk about multifamily and commercial market liquidity, which is one of your um, first talking points tomorrow for the Hills. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, one thing that we are really pushing for with um, this talking point this year is that we are not asking for a federal bailout. None of the issues we are asking for under multifamily and commercial mortgage market liquidity would cost the taxpayer a dime. And that is the very first thing you should make clear to your member of Congress, because they are getting millions of people coming in, asking for help with their industry, and looking for a bail some kind of bailout or some kind of relief. We are not asking for that. All we are asking for are them to remove barriers for the commercial mortgage markets and multifamily mortgage markets to return on their own. So that should be the, a very well received and you should make that point clear right up front. There are two specific legislative proposals that we are advocating for. The first one is covered bonds. This may be a new issue to a lot of you. What is a covered bond? Uh, a covered bond is a type of security, like a mortgage-backed security. Um, but they have one major difference. The bonds are covered or backed by the banks who issue the loans. And the banks have to keep the loans on their balance sheets. They don't just sell them away. Uh, they have, covered bonds have been used quite a bit in Europe, but have not been used in the United States previously. It's important to note that we don't think this would replace the MBS market. We don't think this would replace the secondary mortgage market for multifamily. This is just another tool. Uh, members of Congress have liked this issue. Um, it's been well received so far because it requires the banks to carry skin in the game. Skin in the game is a big catchphrase in Washington right now. There are a lot of people that say that the whole mortgage crisis was caused because lenders did not have any stake in the performance of the loans that they made. They would just sell them off, and if they failed, they didn't care, it was the investor's problem. So with covered bonds, the banks actually still have a stake in, the, in, these, in these loans. And so there's a lot of people that, that um, like that idea. Like I said, it's not going to be, it's not going to solve the whole commercial mortgage crisis, but it's a tool. Legislation was just recently introduced by Representatives Garrett from New Jersey and Maloney from New York. Um, Representative Garrett is a Republican and Maloney is a Democrat. I'm pointing that out because if you go to meet with a Republican, tell them the sponsor is Garrett. If you go to meet with a Democrat, tell them the sponsor is Maloney. Play to your audience. Um, there was a subcommittee hearing on this last month and it was very well received by both sides of the aisle. This was an idea that they really loved. Um, this, again, doesn't cost the federal government a dime. It just would ask the federal government to create a regulatory structure within the Federal Reserve, uh, FDIC, so that this type of market could be created. It's not a controversial bill. This should not be a hard thing to get your member of Congress to sign on to this. It doesn't cost the government anything. It's creating a free market for covered bonds. Again, this isn't going to solve the commercial mortgage crisis, but it's a tool. Okay, the second issue is credit union lending. Credit unions have been providing business loans for over 100 years. But sort of artificially, there was a cap set about 15 years ago for credit unions of a business lending cap of 12.25% of their total assets. So they could only make commercial loans up until that, that threshold. Many credit unions, especially those that do significant commercial lending, are at that cap already. More than half of the outstanding business loans held by credit unions have been extended by those that are already at the cap. This means that the credit unions that have the most experience in this issue of handling commercial loans cannot do any more of these loans. 
This bill would raise the cap to 27.5% of their total assets from their 12.5. We, we supported this bill last year. Last year the cap was 25%. This cap is a little bit higher, but there's some more criteria. This bill would require that only prudent, experienced, well-managed, and well-capitalized credit unions could apply to get this increase. And if a credit union meets this criteria, they would fill out an application, and the National Credit Union Association would have the discretion to approve or deny the application based on its experiences. It's a little different than last year, and they changed it to combat those people who thought, well, there could be a new credit union springing up tomorrow, and all of a sudden they can go up to 25 or 27.5% of their portfolio cap. How do we know they can do this well? They added these criteria to try and combat that to say, okay, only those that have proven they have experience in this area and are performing well can get this cap. So in the Senate, you can ask your senator to co-sponsor S-509. That's the bill in the Senate. In the House, there's not a bill yet. We are expecting one to be introduced momentarily. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't get introduced before our Hill visits, but um, again, this is a bill, it would not, this doesn't count as the taxpayer dime. It has nothing to do with federal lending. It has nothing to do with the government. This is for private credit unions to be able to lend more freely. So that should be, um, a, again, a pretty easy um, bill to do. Um, I'd like to, like to say there are a few other bills people may ask you about. There's a number of other bills um, that some of our commercial um, partners and friends around town um, are promoting that would certainly help with the commercial credit crisis. The only reason we pick these bills is because we believe these are the bills that have momentum that are moving. There's a tax bill out there that we really like for accelerated depreciation, for example. Um, it, it was introduced last year. It didn't move anywhere. We don't expect it to move this year. So we specifically pick these bills because they don't have a cost to the government. They have some momentum now. There's a lot of, they're getting, gaining interest on Capitol Hill and we think they can move. So we think this is the best um, use of your time to support these bills. So um, BJ is gonna talk a little bit about some of the other credit, uh, commercial lending ones, but I just wanted to give you an overview of the legislative ones. And again, I would really start up front saying, we are not looking for a bailout. These do not, will not cost the taxpayer a dime, doesn't risk any government money. These are ways to help the private sector help themselves. Thank you. Excellent points, Megan. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce BJ Yavapati, NER Associate Commercial Policy Representative. And he's going to give us an overview on multifamily and commercial mortgage market liquidity from a regulatory standpoint. Megan did the legislative standpoint. He's going to take a look at the regulatory standpoint. BJ. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, just as the commercial real estate industry is showing signs of recovery, there have been a number of recent regulatory proposals and actions that could hinder this progress. Um, two regulatory issues in particular that could have a significant impact on your industry are lease accounting and term extensions. First, I'd like to cover the issue of lease accounting. And many of you are probably familiar or have heard about this very complex and ridiculous proposal, which most accountants and lawyers don't even understand. Uh, in fact, if you do understand this proposal, then you're not reading it properly. <laughs> Specifically, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, known as FASB and its global counterpart, the International Accounting Standards Board, have proposed significant rule changes on how lease contracts are treated on company balance sheets. Right now, lease contracts are treated as operating expenses for companies leasing space. Under this new proposal, businesses would have to show the full value of these contracts on their balance sheet as a liability. Now, your member of Congress may ask, why does this matter? Well, Imagine you're a company with a lease contract worth, say, $250,000. That includes the rent you're paying on a square footage basis, the number of months in the contract, and any contingent rents or other factors you add in. If you're not a very large company, that $250,000 can throw your balance sheet out of alignment, making it more difficult for you to obtain financing. 
could even put you in technical defaults of your existing credit line if you have one. For example, uh, it might be that the terms of your credit line require you to maintain a certain asset to liability ratio. Well, suddenly you no longer meet that ratio. And the businesses that we space wouldn't be the only ones for it. Property owners would be negatively impacted too because their tenants would want to renegotiate their leases to minimize space and the length of the contract. They would also want to eliminate contingent rents and other terms that increase the size of the contract. And besides reducing property owners' cash flow, these smaller contracts could lower the overall value of the property owners' assets, making it more difficult for them to obtain financing. So when you meet with your members of Congress, it's important to emphasize that this lease accounting proposal could significantly reduce the credit capacity for commercial real estate lessees and lessors. This is especially concerning since the industry has nearly $1.4 trillion worth of loans coming due over the next few years with an already very limited capacity to refinance. Also, um, be sure to urge your lawmakers to hold a hearing on this rational proposal. The next issue that I'd like to go over relates to term extensions. And one major problem that property owners currently face is the ability to refinance the term loans, mainly because they're underwater. One way to overcome this obstacle is through a simple term extension. However, despite 2009 guidance from federal regulators encouraging their bank examiners to allow financial institutions to extend or restructure loans backed by income producing properties, there has been absolutely no consistency amongst examiners. In fact, some lenders are not offering extensions due to pressure from these regulators. Even in cases where the borrower is credit worthy and able to meet monthly payments. So during your meetings, ask your lawmakers to encourage the U.S. Treasury and Federal Reserve to use a more common sense approach by providing greater flexibility for financial institutions to roll over <coughs> distressed but performing loans. This will prevent billions of dollars in unnecessary losses for both borrowers and lenders. If you're able to convey these arguments regarding lease accounting and term extensions here in meetings tomorrow, I'm very confident that we could overcome these regulatory challenges. And this in turn will help stabilize commercial credit markets and help property owners avoid the threat of delinquency and foreclosure. Uh, thank you all very much and good luck tomorrow.